Hello interwebs and welcome to my channel. So for today's video, I'm going to be doing another one of my incredibly niche videos that so few of you watch, but I really hope that all of you that do watch them enjoy them because I love making them. Uh, and that's doing a review of the latest Star Trek novel. This time it's More Beautiful Than Death by one David Mack. Like I said, these videos don't do a ton, but I really appreciate doing them because I just, I'm a huge nerd. I love talking about Star Trek novels. I have way too many of them and I just enjoy talking about them. So thank you all of you who do watch these videos for supporting me. Them. But to actually dive into this book, before I get into my actual non-spoiler thoughts on this novel, uh, it's important to know a few things with this book, because this book actually has uh, an interesting history behind it and a couple of unfortunate things as well. The first thing about this novel that is important to note is that it is the second Kelvin timeline novel that we've ever gotten. Yes, this book, along with Alan Dean Foster's The Unsettling Stars, which came out earlier this year, is one of only two Star Trek Kelvin Time 9 novels that we've ever gotten. Originally, this novel was supposed to be published very soon after Star Trek 2009 came out, the J.J. Abrams reboot uh, with Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, and Nichelle, Nichelle Nichols. Zoe Saldana, not Nichelle Nichols. But this book was put on the shelf and actually never released because Bad Robot, J.J. Abrams' production company, kind of got into a tiff with Paramount about how best to license and merchandise the Star Trek franchise going forward. So while CBS, which had all the TV rights at the time, got to sell as many Star Trek things as they want, Paramount kind of had to like sit on their hands and uh, wait for Bad Robot and J.J. Abrams and Alex Kurtzman and all those people over there to figure out what they wanted to do and gave us Star Trek Into Darkness, which we all know was a perfect film that everyone loved. So. <laughs> so yeah, this book, along with Alan Dean Foster's book, was originally supposed to come out almost 10 years ago uh, at this point, but are finally getting released today because apparently Paramount, especially now that they've merged back with CBS, doesn't really know what they're doing with the Kelvin timeline, so I guess said, ah, screw it, just release them, might as well get them out there. Um, so I'm actually very excited about that fact because we sadly haven't gotten a lot of Kelvin timeline stuff in general, and as someone who actually honestly quite likes the Kelvin timeline quite a bit, I'm glad that we actually get a little bit more taste and time with these versions of the character characters because we don't really get along with them and I, I just I like to always see more, especially more Trek, but I like to see more uh, versions and, and, and different segments of the Trekverse that we don't usually get to see get fleshed out just a little bit more. The second important thing to note with this novel is something that is um, certainly wasn't planned or timed this way, but uh, in a... I guess serendipitous, but serendipitous kind of sounds too positive, but um, in kind of a interesting timing sort of thing. This book also heavily features the character of Sarek, who was played by the actor Ben Cross in Star Trek 2009, and sadly, uh, just a few days, I believe, after this book came out, and just a few days of me recording this video for all of you, uh, Ben Cross sadly passed away. Um, he was an amazing actor, he did an amazing job in a lot of different things, but in particular to all of us Trekkies and to me, uh, he did a fantastic job in Star Trek 2009 portraying Sarek. Uh, all the actors who played Sarek from, you know, uh, the original series into uh, Star Trek 2009 and then the current actor on Star Trek Discovery have all done a fantastic job and all added certain facets to the character, but Ben Cross really brought a, a unique empathy to Sarek, who is a character who, uh, you know, you always have to dig deep to find that empathy with him, and I just love Ben Cross's portrayal of this version of the character. He has a great scene with Spock in Star Trek 2009 with Zachary Quinto, and it's honestly sad to see uh, Ben Cross pass away. Again, this wasn't intended by the writers, authors, or anyone who was releasing this book, but it is um, kind of a nice memorial in a weird way to have this book come out at around the same time that he passed away to sort of uh, remind a lot of us Trekkies uh, how how wonderful his specific contributions were uh, to the Star Trek universe. So my thoughts go to uh, Ben Cross's family, and uh, we as a Star Trek community should certainly uh, give our thoughts and our hope to his family. And um, yeah, uh, Ben Cross, fantastic actor. But moving on, let's talk about this novel in particular, More Beautiful Than Death. Well, what did I think about it? Well, I really, really, really enjoyed this novel. Um, perhaps unfairly, I did a lot of comparisons comparing this novel in my brain as I was reading it uh, to Alan Dean Foster's book, The Unsettling Stars, that came out earlier this year. And again, that is perhaps a little bit unfair, but considering that's the only other Star Trek Kelvin timeline novel that we've gotten so far, and maybe even, this may even be the last Kelvin timeline novel that we will ever get, considering there's no more on the schedule and there's no more planned uh, going forward. I honestly just had to do a lot of comparison to that book. And 
it ended up being very favorable to this novel, no, More Beautiful Than Death, because um, while I did like Alan Dean Foster's take on the characters in that novel, Alan Dean Foster, which, and it may go to show because Alan Dean Foster was much more of an original series writer, he helped write the motion picture, in fact, and he did a lot of novelizations of the animated series books way, way, way back in the day. Um, but Alan Dean Foster's book really didn't feel like they captured the versions of the Calvin timeline characters as well. It felt like they, other than a few things here and there, really could have just been the original timeline versions of the characters. And and that is totally fine. I mean, in all honesty, they are very, very similar, so there's no real need to differentiate them all that much. But because, again, we have so few Kelvin Timeline novels going on here, I, I really... When I do get to see a Kelvin Timeline novel, I really kind of want to see things that are specific to these versions of the characters. Maybe if we had abundance of Kelvin Timeline stuff, I would be less fixed on that. But uh, but here, I think in More Beautiful Than Death, uh, David Mack does a fantastic job utilizing different pathos and uh, character beats that could have only been done with these versions of the characters. Uh in specifically by adding in, as I talked about before, the character of Sarek. Uh, Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto Spock in this novel, I shouldn't say Zachary Quinto Spock because he's not technically playing him, but uh, you can definitely feel those versions of the characters and their dynamic with Sarek and their dynamic with each other. Chris Pine's Kirk is definitely um, much more uh, brash, much less experienced of a captain, and kind of brushes up against Sarek as a sort of um, matriarch, not matriarchal, <laughs> not to say that um, I'm not going to prescribe gender roles on two Vulcans, Sarah can be whatever type of, you know, parental energy he wants to be, but uh, Kirk kind of pushes against the parental figureness of Sarah in this novel, with Sarah kind of being an overbearing figure, kind of questioning a lot of Kirk's decisions because he's not as experienced, and because Kirk never really had a parental figure outside of maybe Pike in the Star Trek 2009 films, he kind of balks at that and pushes back against that. But in a way, I think that really does the character credit. It's not like he's pushing back against him just to push back against him to be the brash, like, uh, you know, wanting to be contrarian captain. No, we see some really, really well done uh, moral questions here about do you do the lawful thing? Do you do the thing that, you know, uh, the actual charters and letter of the law tells you to do? Or do you do what Kirk wants to do and actually just do what is the right thing to do? The thing that's in your heart, the thing that, you know, follow your gut. And that's something that fits Kirk as a character and fits this version of Chris Pine's character, a uh, version of Kirk uh, in specific. And so I thought that David Mack did a wonderful job with that version of the character. And then I really loved uh, Sarek and Spock box dynamic in this as well because there's this sort of undercurrent storyline going on that now because Vulcan is gone, Spock uh, is dating Uhura, a human, and Sarek's basically like, well, uh, Spock, you need to you need to start dating a Vulcan woman because you know <laughs> we need to get you getting your pond far on if you know what I mean. I guess it would be more like more like that. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop that. <laughs> but yes, uh, there's not a lot of Vulcans left, so Vulcans need to get boning, and Sarek, of course, kind of wants Spock to maybe leave Uhura behind and start dating a Vulcan woman, but of course, Spock is like, what, you're being a hypocrite, you married a human yourself with Amanda, so why are you telling me what to do, I'm allowed to be my own person. And again, it's one of those, like, we can understand both characters' point of view, but I think I agree more with Spock. He's allowed to have his own personal autonomy in these things. But again, the it goes back to that Star Trek question: the needs of the few outweigh the needs of uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Um, and that's a very specific question that's gone back and forth in many different iterations of Star Trek, and pl is played wonderfully here. And again, it could only be told with this version of Spock. So fantastic job uh, by David Mack capturing these versions of the characters. All the other characters in the novel. Sulu gets a little bit of stuff to do, kind of like testing him in sitting in the captain's chair for the first time while Captain Kirk's away doing other stuff. I kind of like that sort of hints of Sulu's character growth here, how he's a much younger person and not really suited for command as we would later see him to be in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and even a little bit in, in, in Star Trek Into Darkness. But the rest of the characters like Uhura and Chekhov, they don't really get a ton to do. Scotty gets a little bit of stuff, but overall, not a ton here. McCoy also does a wonderful job, but he's again more a mitigating figure because between Spock, Sarek, and Kirk more than anything else than really having his own stuff to do, which is ultimately a lot of what happens to McCoy anyways in any version of the character, which is sad because I like McCoy, but, you know, it's not like it's anything new for him. The other thing I really like about this book is its uh, story, at least its its uh, its 
concept. The Enterprise is sent to a planet that is being attacked by interdimensional beings called Whites, and they actually came from this area on the planet called the Underdark, this sort of subterranean cave system that got exposed, and these aliens sort of came out and were attacking everyone on the planet. For those of you who probably recognize the term, the term Underdark is actually a fantasy term that comes from like dark fantasy, sort of more horror-tinged fantasy, and that's something that I really love. Like the Mines of Moria in Lord of the Rings, some of my favorite uh, fantasy sections of any fantasy thing. I just, I love horror mixed with fantasy. To see that come into play in a Star Trek novel of all things was honestly insanely, insanely cool. And I, I really appreciated it, its appearance here. And does bring up some interesting stuff for Kirk because it gets into that sort of fantasy element, but Star Trek is a very science-based type universe and show. And again, it calls into questions like, what does he believe? Does he believe in trusting his gut, his faith, his uh, his belief in something bigger, or does he trust science or the letter of the law? It's, it's a great sort of mirroring of the story and Captain Kirk's arc in this novel. I think the only thing bad I can say about this book overall is I think some of the plot things that intrigued me, such as the political dynamics of the planet, kind of get brushed over. Again, like I said, the planet is being attacked by these uh, different white alien beings. There's a military coup, the government falls, things like that, but we don't really get to see all that much of it discussed in the novel is just sort of like background things going on. And as someone who likes the politics of different weird alien planets in my Star Trek, uh, that's why Deep Space Nine is some of my favorite Star Trek overall, uh, I was a little bit disappointed to kind of like not get into the nitty gritty of that. But that kind of fits the Kelvin timeline. I mean, not insulting the Kelvin timeline, but Kelvin timeline is very much more of a faster paced character drama, uh, kind of gloss over some of the nitty gritty details type of universe. So it fits the universe. I was a little bit disappointed in, in that sense because I think there was some good stuff going on. It's by no means bad, it's just not focused on, and that was something that a little disappointed me. But overall, I think this is a really, really fantastic Star Trek novel, especially if you're looking to jump back into the Kelvinverse and, and, and are really missing those versions of the characters. You can't do wrong with this book. David Mack did a fantastic job overall capturing the voices of these characters, capturing this uh, sort of feeling of this universe, the sort of faster-paced Kelvin timeline universe. Uh, I, I really just absolutely adored it. So uh, if you haven't, check it out. But uh, let me know down in the comments if you have checked out this book, because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to get a discussion going. If you haven't checked out of this book, haven't <laughs> you haven't checked out this book, uh, also let me know in the comments if I've intrigued you enough to, uh, you know, get this book. Did you like the Kelvin timeline? Do you want to see more Kelvin timeline novels? That's the thing, too. Uh, if you can, uh, please support this official release. Uh, do, do actually go out and buy this novel in some way, shape, or form, because, like I said, there's not a lot of Kelvin timeline stuff. Uh, I really like the Kelvin timeline, and I would like to see it supported more. Maybe we can get some more books. Maybe we can get some more comics. Maybe we can get some more versions of these types of characters in some way, shape, or form. Or maybe Paramount can get its crap together and actually make another Kelvin Timeline movie at some point or any Star Trek movie at some point. But that can only happen if we actually put our money where our mouth is and support these releases. Yay, capitalism! Isn't it great? But I'd like to hear all your thoughts on all of that down in the comments below. Don't forget you can subscribe to this channel for more, you know, niche discussions of Star Trek books. Um, and also, if you uh, want to support me being able to do videos like this, where they're videos that really won't get a lot of play on the YouTube algorithm, but are something that I really like doing and I hope you do as well. If you want to help support enabling me be, to be able to do these more niche type of videos, please consider helping me out over on Patreon. Uh, you get some cool perks as well, like your name and videos. And it, like I said, it really does help me pay the bills and help me focus on doing things that I'm passionate about, not what uh, the algorithm uh, tells me that I need to be passionate about. So thank you for helping me out there. Uh, and I also have some podcasts. You can help me out with Star Trek Behind the Lines or What the Frow. Those are some two podcasts that I do. The link should be down in the doobly-doo. But beyond all of that, <laughs> the way too many calls to action that I just gave you, beyond commenting, subscribing, following me on uh, podcasts, help me out on Patreon, all that stuff, I'm just glad that you stopped by and I hope that you, as always, Live long and prosper. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, and a special thank you to Piston Twisted Garage, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Bergmas, Ashlyn Solstice, Christina Dalliance, Greg Gillum, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Wayne Twitchell, Alexander Miller, Ish the Mad, Buttoneer, Randy Thompson, Mouse Pounder, Gemshin, Susan Banks, Wellington Marcus, Lorena Mesa, Mari Neckar, John Stell, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Jason Knott, Maeve, Stephen Clinard, Zach Cody, Subraxis, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Dante St. James, Gretchen Badger, Polly Mina, 
Din Hagney, and Bree Beecher. Thank you so much to all of you. I could not do this without you, and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper.